If there were a cookbook with Earth's favorite recipes, it might include using this. Just shake and bake. Your chicken's crisp and tender like fried, but not as greasy as fried. Henry will be so pleased. That's because shake and bake has been around much longer than cooks have been preparing poultry parts by stuffing them into bags of breadcrumbs. Tectonic forces produced our continents, mountains, deep ocean trenches, earthquakes and volcanoes are their byproducts, and the original shake and bake. These forces are ancient, but they're not past tense, as the tourists lining up for Yellowstone's famous geyser, Old Faithful, can attest. The terra beneath your feet may feel firma, but for how long? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, what you can't see can hurt you. Scientists who study geologic forces are trying to understand what goes on deep inside the Earth, but the Earth doesn't make it easy. Find out what this means for those who await the big one in Los Angeles. Also, new research supports the idea that an earthquake may have kicked lava flows into high gear 66 million years ago, contributing to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Plus, a biographer rediscovers the forgotten history of a pioneer of volcanology. We're caught in a traps. <laughs> I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're keenly aware of our faults here. And, and no, I don't mean our obsession with kale smoothies and karaoke yoga. The California landscape is riddled with wrinkles, fault lines that fracture the state north to south. Now, there are two major faults running beneath our cities, our homes, our highways, the Hayward Fault and the San Andreas. And the only place other than Northern California where I worry about a major quake hitting is Southern California, because I've been in one. When I was living in Los Angeles, a nearly seven magnitude earthquake in 1971 just about shook me out of my bed. It gave me quite a scare, but it wasn't the big one. I've only experienced that while on my couch watching Hollywood movies where the mayhem is depicted in hokey, yet entertaining, fare, such as the Great Los Angeles Earthquake from 1990. From the pattern we see developing, I feel there's a high probability it'll happen soon. But if you're wrong, our credibility's in the toilet. We may be sitting on a major disaster here. People have the right to know. That's our responsibility. Okay, these disaster films may be cheesy, but they give some idea of what would happen if a big earthquake were to hit. And these days, imagination is all we have to go on because the 800-mile-long San Andreas Fault has been eerily quiet. And yet the southern segment of the San Andreas, which passes within 35 miles of Los Angeles, has recently been described as locked and loaded and ready to roll by seismologist Tom Jordan at the University of Southern California. He described it in those terms in his opening remarks at the National Earthquake Conference in May 2016. Well, what I said was it was locked, loaded, and ready to roll, but you have to be careful. I didn't mean to say that we have a prediction there's going to be a large earthquake on the San Andreas anytime soon. If you look at that remark, the point is the fault is locked shut by friction. At the same time, the tectonic plates are moving. As you probably know, we have a big Pacific plate to our west, we have the North American plate to our east, and California is right in the middle being stretched along that plate boundary. And we know that that's occurring at a fairly rapid rate. There's about five meters of displacement of the Pacific plate relative to North America every 100 years. And that has to be taken up somehow, primarily in earthquakes. Okay, so what it sounds like you're saying is that you say lock loaded and ready to go. I mean, <laughs> it, it sounds like the, the, the tension for a slip, for a, an adjustment, if you will, in the position of these plates is uh, in the offing. I mean, do you have, I don't know, strain gauges in the rock? How do you know this is true? Well, we know how the plates are displacing. We can see that with GPS systems, the same systems you use in your car can track the plate motion. So we know that pretty accurately. What we don't know is how that strain is going to get released. We can't predict earthquakes. We can't say when they're going to occur, but we think that most of this strain is gonna be released in earthquakes. So the basic point is the energy is in the fault system, has been put into the fault system by the stretching along the plate boundary, and it is capable of producing very large earthquakes. 
Now, I suspect that when you mention this at, uh, at parties, uh, Tom, people are going to ask you the obvious question. When can I expect this to happen? Now, obviously, earthquake uh, prediction is not a precision science, but how do you answer them? What's, what's the probability it's going to happen, you know, sometime in the foreseeable future? Well, we do have models that give us probabilities, and the model that we have for California, the so-called Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast, would say that in the next 30 years, there's about a 50% chance of having a magnitude 7.5 or greater earthquake during that interval. 30 years, 50% chance. Now, that, that magnitude that you use there, that's the Richter scale. Uh, can you give me some idea of, you know, 7.5? Is, is that something that uh, I have to worry about? Do I need insurance against that? You do have to worry about that. I mean, if you think about the Loma Prieta earthquake that occurred in the Bay Area in 1989, that was a magnitude 7.0. Uh, so this is a much larger earthquake. It would affect a much larger area and could cause significant damage. So we worry about these large earthquakes. Uh, however, one of the puzzles we have as scientists is that the models that we have that make these kinds of forecasts are highly uncertain. There are aspects of the data that are a bit puzzling. Well, maybe you could elaborate on that. Uh, give me an example of something puzzling in the data. I mean, is it fundamental? Is it suggesting that the models are so inaccurate that the predictions are inaccurate? Or is this, you know, sort of fine structure in the whole understanding of how earthquakes occur? Well, the problem is in what we call the open intervals. So uh, you can imagine you have a fault that's locked. The energy is put into the fault system by plate tectonics. and the ground gets uh, stretched, uh, energy gets loaded into the fault that way, and then wham, an earthquake will happen that will release that energy and the fault will slip. Now, the time since the last earthquake is what we call the open interval. And you can imagine that you have a big earthquake like the 1906 earthquake in the Bay Area. It's now been 110 years since that event. That would be what we call the open interval. Now the problem is that when we look at open intervals on faults around California, we find lots of faults with fairly long open intervals. And what do I mean by fairly long? I mean that those intervals are comparable to the time between large earthquakes that we can see in the geologic record. Well, this sounds to me a little bit uh, like predicting when the next asteroid is going to slam into the Earth. I mean, we have some data that suggests what the interval is between rocks that are of a certain size, if you will. But that doesn't tell you what to do next week, or for that matter, even in the next hundred years. Well, that's right. But remember, asteroids are kind of a random process. We think there's a lot of randomness in the earthquake system that produces big earthquakes. But that system can only hold a certain amount of energy before it ruptures. And the point is that there is a lot of energy stored in the system. The time since the last earthquake on many fault sections along the San Andreas and elsewhere is fairly long. But during that entire time, energy is being put into the system. And someday that energy has to be released. And so the longer that this goes on, the more energy in the system and the more in the way of large earthquake activity we can expect. Now, the recent realization that the Cascadia subduction zone and that that's off northern california but also you know up in oregon and washington state that could cause some terrifying destruction to the pacific northwest uh has any new research come to light about that fault zone are they sort of uh, under the sword of damocles as well oh absolutely seismologists and earthquake scientists are studying that fault in as much detail as possible that that is a real threat to the northwestern United States because the earthquakes can occur on that type of fault are much larger than what we're talking about in California. The ones in California are along a plate boundary where one plate is sliding past the other horizontally, whereas in the subduction zone, one plate is being shoved underneath another plate. And in the latter case, in subduction zones, the faults are much bigger in terms of the area of the fault. And therefore, the magnitude of the earthquake, which is related to the area of the faulting, is can be much larger. So that's the bad news, is we get huge earthquakes. The good news is that they're offshore. I say good news, that's bad news because they can produce tsunamis. But unlike the San Andreas Fault, they don't run right through the middle of our cities. Now, if you look at a, a map of where earthquakes occur in the United States, you know, I personally was surprised to see places like Massachusetts and Kansas. I mean, what kind of tectonic activity is going on in, in Kansas? 
Well, Kansas is interesting. Uh, there is activity that occurs out in the middle of plates. Uh, for example, you mentioned Massachusetts. Uh, Boston had an earthquake in 1755 that was probably about a magnitude six earthquake, not huge, but it knocked down evidently 10,000 chimneys in the city of Boston. So it shook the place up a bit. These are earthquakes that are occurring in the middle of plates because the plates themselves are being squeezed by the forces that are causing plate tectonics. Kansas is a little bit different. In the central part of the country, we have seen a tremendous rise in the number of earthquakes, fairly small earthquakes, and most of these can be attributed to human activity. In particular, the injection of wastewater deep into the Earth's crust, where it can go down and act to lubricate faults that might not otherwise move, but can move because of this injection of wastewater. Well, you're talking about fracking there. Uh, are, are, are these... No, I'm actually not talking about fracking. Fracking is, is one of the ways you generate this wastewater, but most of the wastewater in Oklahoma, which has the highest rate of seismicity now, even higher than in California in terms of earthquakes of magnitude three, most of that wastewater is coming from oil production, not specifically fracking, but what is called low-cut oil production, meaning uh, where you pump oil out, but a lot of water comes with it. You gotta get rid of the water, and so that water is re-injected back into the Earth's crust, and that can cause earthquakes. Now, one of the uh, issues that you discussed at the conference, and is something that I'm sure comes up with you all the time, is the development of an early warning system for earthquakes. Um, <laughs> is there any idea about how we might do that? I mean, do we have such a thing? Well, we do have a, such a system, a prototype system that has uh, been put into place in the West Coast, in California, and is also being deployed in, in the state of Washington, which, uh, depending on the circumstances, can give short but very valuable warning times for large earthquakes. But the way the system works is that you have uh, seismometers out near where earthquakes might occur. When the earthquake starts, the seismometers can sense that there is ground motion. Uh, that information can be transmitted at the speed of light down the line, so to speak, before those big shaking waves generated by the earthquake faulting get to you. And it might give you some small but significant warning time. So it's a bit like seeing, I don't know, the flash from a gun from half a mile away that gets to you faster than the bullet, might give you enough time to get out of the way kind of thing? Yeah, kind of uh, duck. You know, you can drop cover and hold on. <laughs> All right, well, let's say I'm in a subway, you know, and I don't know, this could happen anywhere in the world where they have subways, which is a lot of places in the world. Would there be sufficient warning from this kind of a system to cut the power to the subway before the shaking starts? Well, obviously, it depends on the, on the circumstances. Uh, if you have an earthquake fault that ruptures right underneath you, there's no warning time whatsoever. But on the other hand, let's take the San Francisco Bay region. If you have an earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, let's say on the San Francisco Peninsula, there is warning time that can be transmitted to BART, and the BART system is set up to where it can be automatically shut down, triggered by the earthquake early warning. Looking at the big picture, Tom, I mean, we've experienced earthquakes for, you know, I, I suppose ever since Homo sapiens became aware of its surroundings, and uh, we've been enduring them all, all that time. We still can't do too much about them. Uh, is that going to be the case forever, or at least until the earth cools down enough to you know, stop all tectonic activity? Are we ever going to be able to predict earthquakes, you know, a, a day ahead? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm not very sanguine that we're going to be able to predict earthquakes reliably within, you know, days or weeks. But we are making steady progress in trying to build up forecasting capabilities. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll make discoveries that will allow us to do that. One thing is for sure, we're not gonna be able to control earthquakes. We're going to have to live with large earthquakes. And that's something we have to negotiate with our mother planet Earth. And what that requires us to do is to build our environment in such a way that it can withstand and bounce back from strong shaking. Well, then finally, Tom, I've got to ask, your office is in an old brick building there in central Los Angeles. Uh, do you feel safe going to work? Well, you know, when I first got to USC in this old brick building built in 1929, uh, I did not feel safe because that building had not been retrofit. But once we moved in, uh, USC very kindly retrofit that building 
so that it is now a pretty safe building when it comes to life safety. I think if there's a big earthquake, uh, I'll probably be okay. The building might be severely damaged, but the people in the building will probably be okay. Well, Well, I hope so. Tom Jordan, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Well, very good. Tom Jordan is a seismologist and the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center at the University of Southern California. It's something like a weather prediction where you can't say precisely how much rain is going to fall or even if it's going to rain. You can only say, oh, 70% chance or something like that. But Tom Jordan would say you can't use the word prediction. You need to use forecast. Well, okay, so it's even more like the weather, isn't it? (laughs) But I do think we've been lulled into a certain degree of denial here in California because it's been so quiet, tectonically speaking, for so long. Well, an earthquake can do significant damage to urban areas today. Could one also have done major damage to the planet's population 66 million years ago? Everybody knows about the asteroid, but could an earthquake have stimulated massive volcanic activity that played an important role in wiping out the dinosaurs and 70% of the other species? All eyes turn to the Deccan traps in India. We are caught in a traps. It's big picture science. Okay, you've got a job to fill and any old online posting just isn't going to do it. You're not simply hunting for candidates, you want someone who will bring value to your organization. Well, with ZipRecruiter, you've got an edge. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't rely on candidates finding you, it finds them. Consider this, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. And the process is easy peasy. There's no wrestling with emails and callers. You simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy to use dashboard. ZipRecruiter works. It's out there and it's being used every day by businesses of all sizes to find the best candidates and quickly. And right now, big picture science listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free, no cost. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash big picture. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash big picture. Got it? Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash big picture. NASA has its eye on the sky. Well, several eyes, actually. The space agency is scanning the solar system for asteroids with Earth's name on them. Although small asteroids the size of an office building, for example, are still unknown, they have mapped most of the big ones and know they're going to miss Earth in the coming decades. So come up with another excuse to bow out of your high school reunion. We have reason to fear rocks from space, and many children have reason to resent one rock in particular for having a hand in wiping out their favorite animals. Tyrannosaurus rex, that's my best favorite. Next, Triceratops. Then it's Brachiosaurus, the one that I loved when I was three. I don't love it as much now, but I like it. It was one of the fastest and awesomest dinosaurs I loved. The dinosaurs are undoubtedly the best known living creatures wiped out in the Cretaceous Tertiary or KT extinction event, but they're not the only ones. 70% of Earth's species disappeared then. It's generally accepted that an impact was involved, either an asteroid or a comet, one that released energy equal to a billion times that of an atomic bomb. The discovery of a 65 million year old impact crater, Chicxulub, in the Yucatan Peninsula supports this theory, but the case of the disappearing dinos isn't closed. Much like a classic whodunit, which in this case would be a what done it, another suspect has been lurking in the shadows, a massive lava flow now cooled into the dramatic-looking Deccan traps, which are on the Deccan Plateau in India, they may have played a major role. Enormous lava flows stacked one on top of another, big black formations of basaltic lava that have traveled in some cases up to a thousand kilometers from their source. The volume of these lavas that came out all within perhaps only several million years or less was enough to cover the state of California in about a mile thick. So this is an enormous event. 
The timing of this volcanic eruption has raised eyebrows. Geologists have dated it to somewhere around the end of the Cretaceous period, suggesting to them that the Deccan traps played a role, perhaps a primary one, in the extinction. And the bickering, well, enlightened scientific debate between researchers over rock versus volcano has been going on for decades. I'm telling you, Horowitz, the asteroid did in the dinosaurs. The volcanic eruptions didn't matter. Yes, they did, Whipple. That is all that mattered. There the department heads go again. I'll never get my timesheet signed. The traps were a sideshow. A space rock killed off the dinos. No, the impact was a blip. The die-off was well underway because of the volcanic gas. A hundred bucks says your next paper isn't accepted to a major journal without significant revisions, you sulfur dioxide gas bag. Well, I doubt that your next paper will even make it to peer review, <gasps> you basaltic rockhead. And there's a lot at stake. I mean, any scientist who can conclusively explain the death of the dinosaurs will be in the textbooks forever. And to be fair, it's difficult to discern whether the die-off was a short or a prolonged event. And by prolonged, I mean thousands of years. If you're looking at really thin layers of rock, it's hard to tell what took place during the Cretaceous Tertiary event. There's no doubt that this 200 kilometer wide crater in Yucatan, Mexico called Chicxulub happened at pretty much exactly that time. There is some doubt actually about how rapidly the dinosaurs went extinct. Earth and planetary scientist Mark Richards at the University of California in Berkeley isn't taking sides. I have studiously avoided taking a strong stand on whether the impact or the volcanism at Deccan was primarily responsible for the mass extinction. But the fact that we had both of these events happening pretty much at the same time is pretty remarkable. And his team's new research is all about the timing. The team has had a theory that the volcanic eruption may have played a role, but recently tested their hypothesis by doing careful dating of the Deccan basalt. They used a high-precision process called argon-argon dating that measures the amounts of particular isotopes of radioactive argon that are left in a sample. The team's results state the volcanism to be within 50,000 years of the impact, but something more dramatic. His team's analysis suggests that the Deccan traps began accelerating their output of lava, effectively doubling it at that time. All right, folks, this production line is a little sluggish. I'm looking at the numbers here, and we ain't making our quota. So we're going to pick up the speed, all right? Double her up. So the new hypothesis in summary. Deccan volcanism was already underway when the rock hit in the Yucatan Peninsula. The impact triggered a massive 11-magnitude earthquake that then kicked lava production into high gear. Okay, uh, let's unpack that a little. The Chicxulub impact is the largest crater we know of in the last 600 million to billion years in Earth history. And it happens to have coincided not just with the Deccan Traps eruptions, which might not have been such a terribly difficult coincidence because these things come and go, but it seems to have happened exactly at the time when the Deccan Traps accelerated into a very rapid phase. Of, of eruption. And when you say exactly within 50,000 years or so, but when you're dating rocks and geologic events, that's almost, that's almost simultaneous. Yeah, you're correct that using the term exactly in, in science is always actually has to be qualified. Uh, and when we speak among ourselves, we know what we're talking about, but it's a good point. The, the precision of the argon-argon dating work that's been done on the impact and the extinction boundary, and now Deccan, which we published in October, has a precision of order 30 to 50,000 years, plus or minus, for events that are going happening at about 66 million years ago. So when we say exactly what we really mean, technically, is within radiometric dating precision. They're indistinguishable. The hypothesis that uh, we published, we published initially in the Geological Society of America Bulletin, and it was based on a large amount of almost entirely circumstantial evidence that suggested to us that there was a sequence of lava flows that initiated kind of roughly halfway through the Deccan Traps. The Deccan Traps were already erupting at the time of the impact, so we know that the volcanic system was not fundamentally generated by the impact. And the evidence suggested to us that the system was really kicked into high gear by, by dynamic stresses from the, the magnitude 11 or so earthquake that was caused by the Chicxulub impact. 
And so we published that hypothesis, and we actually said where within the stack of lava, stratigraphically speaking, we thought would be the time of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary and the impact. And we went out on a limb on that. But, and we did not have the precise argon-argon dating. So we were, you know, we were sticking our necks out a bit. But it was nice to have a falsifiable hypothesis. And, and so when the new dates came in uh, that we published in October, that was very gratifying. It's not the final word. We have a lot more work to do. But it came out as close to the answer we predicted as, as the precision of the method would allow. And we're hoping that within six or eight months, we'll be able to say even more definitively exactly where within the stack of Deccan lavas is actually the KT boundary. And that, that's something that if you'd asked me two or three years ago whether we would ever even know that, I would have been surprised. Now, let's say more about that specific prediction then and what the evidence is supporting. As you said, the Deccan traps were already flowing. And what happened at that change chronologically is that they began to accelerate in their outpouring of lava. And your hypothesis is that the impact maybe didn't trigger the Deccan traps outflowing, but accelerated their output. Is that right? That, that's correct. We're, there's fairly wide agreement that the Deccan traps are the result of a, a new mantle plume, that is a plume of hot material from the core mantle boundary arriving beneath the Indian plate sometimes prior, somewhere probably prior to 67 million years or so ago. And as this hot blob rises underneath the plate, it undergoes partial melting. And that's where you get the energy to generate the magma. And the, like I said, the Deccan traps had already been erupting for at least a million years or so, maybe more, prior to the impact. So I, I really have to explain this carefully. That We do not think that action at a distance, this, you know, 130 degrees epicentral distance away from the impact could have caused the melting. But what we know is that Earthquakes do trigger volcanic systems. For example, the great 1960 Chilean earthquake triggered volcanoes in the Andes uh, within several months, I think, of, of the earthquake. And what we think happens, although we don't really understand the physics very well, is that if the volcanic system you can think of as a porous, overpressurized medium where there's magma pressure inside, and if you give it a very strong shake, then the effective permeability or the ability of magma to move around in that system increases. Well, I believe you've also described it, and this may be more accessible to listeners, but maybe not technically accurate, is that the impact damaged the plumbing. I, I don't know that I ever said that, but it's a really good term. Uh, you know, there, there's another analogy that I would think of people might have familiarity with. If you take a, a snow cone or a slushy, and if you move it around slowly, it behaves kind of like it's a solid with fluid inside. But if you give it a shake, then it fluidizes and, and, and slushes around, and there's kind of a threshold you reach. So I think that when you have a, a large volcanic system, and the Deccan Traps was an enormous volcanic system with lots of plumbing, and you give it a shake with uh, very strong surface waves coming from an enormous earthquake, it's plausible that this system could be kicked into high gear. And there's, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that that's what happened. And that's actually been known loosely for some time. I think we're the first to kind of put together all the lines of evidence. But what no one else had suggested was that the initiation of that transition had happened right at the impact time. And that's what we set out to test. And are you interested in the fact that it was accelerating? Because if it's accelerating the flow of this lava, then you have more of it and you have more gas in the air and then this might contribute to our understanding of what happened to the dinosaurs. So the acceleration is important for that reason. Yeah, you put that very well. I wish some of our other colleagues would as easily understand it, uh, to be honest with you, because uh, it appears to us that the largest and most rapid phase of eruption of Deccan began immediately after the impact and after the, the extinction boundary as it's kind of formally defined and uh, stratigraphically. So it's not clear how rapidly some of the larger organisms such as dinosaurs went extinct. And it may be that uh, their extinction was a result of both causes or one or the other. So there is a lot to be sorted out here. But what we've shown, regardless of this hypothesis about triggering, what we've learned from the from this work so far is that the most massive phase of Deccan volcanism and the impact more or less coincided in time. And that wasn't known a couple years ago. The effect of an impact 
ha has some similarities to that of volcanism. You put a bunch of nasty stuff in the air. The Chicxulub impact happened to have hit a carbonate shelf in the northern part of Yucatan, which released a lot of carbon dioxide and probably sulfur dioxide as well, and that's what volcanoes do too. The big difference is the volcanism occurs over a much longer period of time, whereas the impact occurs in minutes. I wonder if you could explain more about what happens when you have an impact and when you have a massive lava flow like this, because certainly some species are going to die when there's an impact, and some species will die when there's a lava flow. But it's really what happens to the atmosphere subsequently, isn't it? And I wonder if you could say more about that. I mean, volcanoes, really what they produce, as you said, is gas. To produce a mass extinction, you have to do something globally. So an impact is local. The Deccan volcanism, although it's enormous, is, is localized to that region of India. So in any case, you're looking at causal mechanisms that are basically global climate impact one way or another. The quality, the character of the atmosphere, surface temperatures, et cetera. So if you dump a bunch of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere and then it gets aerosolized, my understanding is that within months to years, the the planet kind of absorbs it and gets rid of it. You get acid rain and it's done. Whereas CO2 has a much longer, carbon dioxide has a much longer cycle time, the hundreds to thousands of years. And then if you have a lava flow or a sequence of lava flows that goes on for thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, then you have to take that into account as well. So in a way, at this point, everything comes down to timing, the precise timing of what happened when. and. Part of that will, of course, be which organisms went extinct, when and how rapidly, which organisms survived. You know, turtles and crocodiles, some crocodiles did perfectly well. Apparently, freshwater aquatic critters and furry little creatures called mammals that became us seemed that, to- That burrowed. That they, bur were burrowing and burrowing so forth animals. did okay. And a few of the- uh, the, there were, bird, there were, I guess, many different lines of birds at that time, but a few of the bird species made it through and then flourished to become the incredible diversity of birds that we have now. And birds are dinosaurs, by the way, so people often refer to the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. You talk about understanding the precise timing, but time also factors into this because when we think of a catastrophic event, we think of something that happens instantly. And what's hard to get one's mind around is the time period over which this happened, that when the species went extinct, it was over many, many thousands, if not millions of years? That's not clear. It's not clear. That, it's not clear just how rapid the Cretaceous tertiary extinction events were. I thought it was a slow suffocating event. There are scientists, there are paleontologists who advocate for that. You know, for example, many paleontologists will say that the dinosaurs were already on their way out. They were declining at least half a million years to maybe as much as five million years before the what we call the mass extinction. I'm not entirely convinced that the evidence for that is, is all that strong. And uh, when, when I've pressed people who are experts on this, they allow for, for the possibility or maybe even the probability that there was, you know, perhaps decline as there could have been just as kind of background noise, but that the most of the dinosaur species associated with the KT extinction could have gone extinct very rapidly, just you know immediately after the impact. And the other thing I should mention is that of the so-called big five mass extinctions since the Precambrian era, the last three are associated very closely in time with massive flood basalt events. For example, the Triassic-Jurassic boundary is associated with the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. And the largest mass extinction of all, larger than the one that killed the dinosaurs, happened at the end of the Permian period, the Permian-Triassic boundary, and is very closely associated in time with a, a flood basalt event that was about three times the size of Deccan. And in fact, that event has become widely accepted to have been caused by volcanism. The Siberian, the Siberian traps, traps as a cause for the in Permian crisis. 250 million years ago. 250 million years ago. And the Central Atlantic province was 200 million years ago. So there is no accepted evidence for impact at any of those other boundaries. So the coincidence at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is all the more disturbing. Mark Richards, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. This has been fun.
Mark Richards is a professor of Earth and Planetary Science at the University of California, Berkeley. It's not easy to decipher the seismic data from tectonic forces deep within the planet today, so imagine trying to do it a century ago. Next, the story of a man who did just that, as told by a fellow volcanologist who shares his fascination with what lies below. What I like are the remote areas of the planet. There's something about getting close to the center of the Earth. At least now you know that this show is deep. Caught in a traps on Big Picture Science. The geology of the Earth may be old, but the science of geology is not. Just a hundred years ago, we didn't even know about the existence, let alone the movement, of continental plates, or what caused earthquakes or volcanoes, or even something as basic as the most ordinary properties of lava. A man named Thomas Jagger took on these questions. A geologist at Harvard at the turn of the last century, who, you could say, became the first volcanologist in 1902, when he and the rest of the world's attention turned to news reports coming from the island of Martinique in the Eastern Caribbean. Martinique was built by volcanoes, part of an active arc that traces the boundary of the North American plate and the Caribbean plate. At the beginning of the 20th century, the island town of St. Pierre was bustling and cosmopolitan, the Paris of the Caribbean and it lay just four miles from the Mount Pele volcano. As far as the residents knew, the volcano was a gentle giant. It had been quiet for more than a half century. But then, Mount Pele came roaring to life. It started off as a rather moderate explosion. Some of the volcano was about two miles away from the coast, and so people on ships saw the small explosion. But what really caught their eye is that there was this glowing cloud that started to cascade down the side of the volcano at about 100 miles per hour. The glowing cloud was a deadly mix of hot gas and volcanic debris, what geologists today identify as pyroclastic flow, a phenomenon seen in the eruption of Mount St. Helens almost 80 years later. In a few short minutes, the deadly Mount Pele cloud had covered the town of St. Pierre, and more than 25,000 residents had perished. The town burned for days. As newspapers described the catastrophe, readers couldn't believe the reports. How could so many people have died from a volcano in modern times? In his book about Thomas Jagger, volcanologist John Dvorak says that the Harvard geologist was determined to find out and set sail for the Caribbean. He was hoping for many years to go out and study the Earth in terms of earthquakes and, and volcanoes, and he saw this as an opportunity. Now exactly what he was going to do, he wasn't sure. The only thing of a scientific instrument that he brought was a thermometer that could measure up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit and, and a pocket watch. So this was not technically sophisticated equipment. Well, that's right. And people didn't really know what to do in terms of an eruption. We didn't have instruments or very many instruments to record earthquakes. We didn't have any to try and record the uplift or drop of the ground as magma moves into a volcano. We didn't have anything to sample the gases either. I mean, this was at the very beginning of the scientific study of volcanoes. And his thermometer would only go up to 150 degrees, so I could have taken my kitchen thermometer and it would have recorded hotter temperatures than what, what he had. Well, that's right. People didn't even know what the temperature of magma was at this point. They had a crude estimate. For example, at Vesuvius, when a lava flow would come down, um, it would be common that people would throw coins into it. And people would realize that if you threw a coin that was silver, it would probably melt. But the copper ones wouldn't. And that was sort of the only indication we had as to what the temperature of lava was. Well, it's 1902, and Thomas Jagger is on his way to the Caribbean. When does he arrive, and what does he see when he gets there, to the site of the destruction of Mount Pele? Well, he arrives about three weeks after the uh, 
eruption and the death of the 25,000. And when he finally gets there, he is completely astonished. What the newspapers have said are true. 25,000 people died instantly. This entire city has been erased by a single explosion. He went and he slogged through all the mud, which had uh, blanketed the city. He was astonished by all the bodies. He found a baker who went and tried to hide in his oven. They opened the oven doors and they could find this man had curled up. He uh, apparently was hoping to protect himself from the explosion. The irony of crawling into an oven to escape something even hotter than an oven. That's right. And of course, the baker was uh, cooked on the inside of his own oven as a result of it. So it was in Professor Jagger's mind, it was a horrible experience. It was something which was surreal. It was something that was not in the textbooks. Nobody had ever described all of this. His life really changed around that moment, and he devoted himself to studying the causes of volcanoes and understanding earthquakes. And we hear about tornado chasers. He was kind of a volcano chaser, wasn't he? And, and where did it take him around the world, his passion? Well, yes, he was very much for the rest of his life. He went off to initially in the Caribbean, he went off to Vesuvius in Italy. It was the largest eruption in 1906 in uh, 300 years. He took an expedition up to Alaska. Very little was known about the volcanic activity in Alaska. He was on his way to Japan in 1909 when he happened to stop in the Hawaiian Islands. And that's where he saw the remarkable lava lake at Kilauea. It is a pool of molten rock. It glows bright red. It churns slowly. It very much looks as if it's alive. And that was very much the magnet which caused him to abandon his life in Boston and to move out to uh, one of the outer Hawaiian islands. Thomas Jagger was driven by his quest to understand volcanoes and earthquakes and the restless earth, and yet he is not well known. And one of the reasons for that is you write in the book, as you put it, he was a scientific vagabond. And in what way did that contribute to his obscurity that you are now trying to rescue him from? Well, yes, he was very much an outsider. He uh, began on the normal career track. He was educated at Harvard. He became a professor at Harvard. He became the head of geology at MIT. He was highly respected around the world for his study of volcanoes. And he essentially gave all that up. We should say that that included his, his wife and his family. That's right. He uh, gave up his wife and children. He very seldom ever saw his children again. He gave up his professional prestige. He gave up his money. He worked independently. He found his own funding and uh, he lived out and started what is today known as the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. But that took him out of the academic world. And so most of his peers never thought he really amounted to very much at all. And it's only in hindsight, after almost a century, that we're understanding what he contributed to our understanding of volcanoes. He meets Isabel Madewell in Hawaii. She's a widowed school teacher and they build a new life there. And part of it was building the Hawaiian Volcanic Observatory. Um, what were some of the central questions that Dr. Jagger was trying to answer about volcanoes and earthquakes? Well, the first question he wanted to answer, probably the most driving question, if you look at the textbooks of the time, early 20th century is, what is the temperature of molten lava? And he went through a lot of effort to try to pin that down. And now we know that molten lava is about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit or about 1100 degrees Celsius. There was also this question at Mount Pele, people finally understood that volcanic eruptions are the result of the release of gas inside magma. But the question is, what is the nature of that gas? And he and others understood that almost all of the gas coming out of a volcano is water vapor. He was also keenly aware that as magma moves into and erupts from a volcano, the surface of the volcano moves up and down. 
And he was the first one to measure that. If you ever go to a science fair and you see a model of a volcano, whether it's a model of a volcano with the gas coming out or the paper mache model with the balloon inside blowing up and down, that all comes from the work of Professor Jagger. He came up with all these new techniques for studying volcanoes and, and measuring their temperature and collecting their gas. But to do that, he sometimes put himself in danger. And I wonder if you could just tell us a story about how far he was willing to go. Well, it's sort of a matter of perspective. If you feel he put himself in danger or he was in search of adventure or he was trying to solve what I think the most fundamental question, and that is trying to predict eruptions. For example, when he tried to measure the depth of the lava lake at Kilauea, he put together a whole series of stainless steel bars to make one long one about 200 feet long, and he literally shoved it in. It was a sounding of the lake, and he shoved it in as deep as he could, which was about 60 feet. How did Thomas Jagger protect himself from the, the gases um, and inhaling the gases? And he was also trying to measure and collect the gas at the same time. They had to protect themselves from the fumes. And what they would do is wet a sponge and they tie it around their face. And that's as sophisticated as it was back in the 1910s. For the gas collection, what he had was like a glass vial, which was evacuated. So there's no air in it. And he would put it on the end of a long stick and he would tap the end of the vial and crack the glass. And there'd be a rush of gas into the vacuum. And then he'd put the cracked end into the lava and it would seal it off. And what could scientists learn from the analysis of the gas that came from a volcano? Um, well, it was known after 1902, finally, that a volcanic eruption is powered by the release of gas. But we didn't know what the nature of the gas was. It's finally that through these uh, collection of gases at Kilauea, we know that by far the majority of the gas is water vapor with a substantial amount of CO2. You identify with Thomas Jagger on one level, his, his quest, his passion, and that he had an epiphany in his life that led him to study volcanoes and earthquakes for the rest of his life. And in a similar fashion, you left what was conventional you left your job at the USGS in order to pursue nature maybe unadulterated. Well, that's right. I left the standard job for the government. I took a very different kind of job that permitted me to uh, see nature on a different level. Can you say a bit about what it is about him and what drove him that you identify with? Well, in my own career, when I was in middle age, I felt also that what I really needed to do and what I wanted to do was to actually live as Professor Jagger did out on an active volcano. I wanted to be close to them. I wanted to feel the earthquakes. There is often this disconnect between modern society and the dynamics of the earth. There is this Western philosophy that nature is to be challenged and controlled. I see it very differently that it's more like a web, that we are truly just part of the nature, that we are one component. Can you explain the, the moment of epiphany that you had that maybe was parallel to Thomas Jagger witnessing the eruption of Mount Pele? Well, in my own life, there was an epiphany. It happened on May 17, 1982. I was the only Westerner in this particular village in West Java on the very lower slopes of a volcano named Galungun. And on that night, I saw a series of explosive eruptions rise up into the air. I came away understanding that the power which I had just witnessed would probably never be equaled by anything I saw produced by society. And where do you live now? I live on the island of Hawaii. From my bedroom, I can see the glow of the lava lake at Kilauea. John Dvorak, thank you so much for speaking to us. Well, thank you for having me today. John Dvorak is a volcanologist who worked with the United States Geological Survey for 16 years. He is the author of The Last Volcano, A Man, A Romance, and the Quest to Understand Nature's Most Magnificent Fury. Well, we know more now about earthquakes 
and volcanoes than we did in Thomas Jagger's time, but there's still many questions. Well, there are also many difficulties. Predicting earthquakes depends on understanding, you know, what causes the rupture to break and getting instrumentation that can measure that, that situation. That's obviously one of the greatest challenges to geology there is. And the other thing we've learned in the show is that if, if you have a murder mystery that goes back 65 million years involving geology, well, at least the geology allows you to look at the evidence because it's there in the rock. But on the other hand, it's so long ago and it's so subtle, it's very difficult to unravel it. Look at how long we've been spending trying to figure out what did in the dinos. And the theory that we have now is that a rock hit the earth and there was an enormous earthquake and that accelerated the flow of lava and so maybe it was a one, two, three punch that did in the dinosaurs. And I think we can thank Thomas Jagger for his contribution because he took a phenomenon, volcanoes, that was just a spectacle and he turned that into a science. We want to give magma animus thanks to the hot talents who helped produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Sholsky David and Sammy David. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the episode Caught in a Traps. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find it in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because it was once the hot new thing or simply because your radio sits next to your lava lamp, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you listen to our show via iTunes, we invite you to leave a review on our iTunes page. And to reach us directly with your comments, be sure to throw in some faint praise and then email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. They sounded like stomping on the ground. It wasn't that loud, but it was from the plant eaters. Like, they would stomp pretty loud. The more smaller it is, the more it doesn't stomp.